leave standing after you shake hands, if you will. What's up, Lou? Guys, remain standing, if you will. While we are standing, let's do this to start this week. Let's give it up for Pastor Matt, Dr. Keith, and Pastor Mike for preaching. Incredible. So thankful for them. Awesome. You can be seated. While you're being seated, go ahead and grab your smartphone. If you've got a phone, get it out. If you have the ability to text, get your phone out right now, if at all possible. If you do not have the ability to text, we will give you a sheet of paper in a few weeks so you can just hang out and look around and look at all the people that are dumb because we have smartphones. All right, so um, listen, if you're visiting um, with us new to church, let me explain to you about something. Um, church runs on rhythms. We are getting ready to run into a brand new ministry season. The summer, even though I believe our church has no off season, the summertime is a little bit different, especially in the South. We've had lots of people on vacation, lots of people at the lake, lots of people really quickly in the next few weeks will get back into what I would call a great rhythm. And that's ultimately because of school. We all get back into the rhythm because of school and people come back to church. So a couple things I want to talk to you about. Look around. This is actually a service... Um, that's, down, that's probably the third attended service this week. We don't have tons of room for people to sit. We do have a few dude spacers, so we know a couple things. Let's just talk turkey for a minute here. We know that um, in a few weeks, people are going to really get back into rhythm. We have lots of people coming back to church. They're back into it, so the parking lot gets crowded. So what am I going to tell you? Drop the hammer on the back 40 when you get out of church, right? Don't be looking at your phone. That's against the wall now. When you're driving, you're like not at a traffic light, and technically that is a long traffic light. Um, but let's just make room for others. Most importantly, I want you and I to pray together for this next ministry season. So with your phone, if you will do this with, with me, and we've done this um, time after time, and it's very effective, I want you to text the word PRAY10 to 97,000. You're going to text the word PRAY10 to the number 97,000. When you do that and you hit SEND, it's automatically going to sign you up. And starting on August the 12th through August the 21st for 10 days, we are going to pray together as a church in unity. You're going to get one text a day for 10 days, and I want you to dwell on that text, whether that word or that thought or that scripture, for us as a church to step into this next ministry season with lots of boldness. We have so much to accomplish. The best days are ahead. I'm so excited. But if we don't bathe this next season in prayer, it's all for naught. We have to let God do the work. We will do our best. God does the rest. We put him first. So do me a favor. This is a great way that we can all jump in together and focus on one thing per day together as we jump into the next ministry season. Why are we doing it from August 12th through the 21st of August? The 21st, 4th, and 5th, we, be, we begin a brand new series that's one year in the making. I'm calling the series Distracted. It is a full bore series on the family. Um, everybody's going to get something out of it. We're going to run two, two tracks. We're going to talk about family and church family and how today, uh, track with me, we are so connected, we are disconnected. And so we are distracted. So this is a perfect series to invite somebody that might be struggling in their home, marriage, children, trying to find marriage, all of those things. We are going to go back and we're going to lock in on a family series that I, I haven't done one in a long time that's so needed. So that series is the perfect weekend to jump off and say, wow, I can, inv I can not only come to church and grow my faith, but invite somebody to come along with me. The South Knoxville and the Greensboro Family Fest, they are designed that our generosity will really shine and earn us the right to talk about our theology, and that's our relationship with Christ. We don't want to just give backpacks away and pass out water and make the world a better place to go to hell from. Okay, we want to pray for fruit. We want to not get weary in doing good for the harvest is plentiful if we don't give up. We will reach those people. We got to keep going. Today, I've been reading studies on vacation. This is interesting. Called, there's a thing called compassion fatigue. 
That people are so fatigued about, hey, I don't really want to help anybody anymore. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. It seems like we're overwhelmed with so many bad things on a day-to-day basis. We've tried it all. There's no sense even trying it anymore. Guys, we got to keep on, keep on, keeping on, keeping on. We got to make every difference that we can make. And our generosity and our love is going to earn us the right to talk to people about a relationship with Jesus Christ that matters the most. Are y'all with me? Because I'm fired up. All right, all right. So do me a favor. Text that word, pray. Let's do it. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I just told you we're starting a series in three weeks. Um, you're like, well, Brent, that's a, August 21st is a long time away, the 25th. What are we going to do for the next three weeks? I'm going to preach from my heart. Some things that happened to me on vacation, man, I have some sermon illustration gold, but I can't use it for three weeks. So it's going to kill me. Not to kind of let you in on a few things that happen, but I really want to just use these three weeks to fuel us, to challenge us, to inspire us. I want to talk to you from my heart. We're going to be off series. I love that. We're, I mean, I'm just going to let God be God, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what's been going on and what happened and how this can affect all of us today um, into the next day and the next day and the next day, this next season in the life of our church. I'll, I'll start with this. Ephesians 4, we're going to land with that at the end. I would love for you to take a few notes. This this message is not necessarily structured. I literally have preached forever. Wednesday night, I was like 10 minutes over, and I'm like, God, you got to give me clarity and brevity. And last night, I'm like, okay, I'm going to do better. I preached seven minutes longer. <laughs> and then the first service we got out about, I, I did a little bit better, so I'm, I'll try my best to hone this in, but this is not necessarily a structured message. There's not three points in a poem. Like if you grew up in church, you know, sometimes I like to stay really focused because our attention spans are very narrow, to which some of you are like, what would you say? Um, so have you ever felt, and I know I'm at, an, I'm, I'm at an age in my life, I'm not as old as Scott, <laughs> but have you ever felt like sometimes this wave, this wave hits you that I'm getting old? Who's ever had something happen where you're like, I'm just, what happened? Where'd my life go? Okay, I was been on the beach the last few weeks. Um, I was down with my wife's family. We do the same thing. We've been to the same place for 20 years this year, 20 years. Crazy, Indian Rocks Beach. I showed up there. We had put all of our stuff in our spot. We all have our rooms. We've been there for so long with Giovanna's family. I mean, it's like a military. Um, we just know how to, it's an invasion. We know how to put everything in rooms, and we've got it all. I mean, my father-in-law plans for this Mount Everest expedition three months before we get there. We literally have boxes with room numbers on it. We take them there, and we put the, put the cups out, and this and that. I mean, down to the trash bags. My mother-in-law, people ask, she's doing horribly bad. She has riddled with Alzheimer's. Last year, we took her to the beach. That's how the Italians roll. We rented an ambulance, literally out of our own pocket, took her to the beach. We put a hospital bed in her room because we wanted to be together as a family. And we cried like crazy. This is going to be the last year. Well, guess what? She's been hanging on, and we did the same thing last week. We, we, got, the, we got the ambulance, put the hospital bed up in the, in the, on the fifth floor. I tell my father all the time, we have have a room on the first floor, but he wants her to have a room with a view. So we have to carry that hospital bed up to the fifth floor. And my brother-in-laws, we were taking that hospital bed down as we closed Beach Week down this year. And we all basically said, hey, wonder if my, our mother-in-law is going to be here next year. And I raised my hand and said, I am not betting against her. So my wife spends time with her mom and dad as she should. My son and daughter, my, my daughter's old, but all of the cousins are old now. They're all in their mid-20s. Mason was the afterthought. You know, he's 16. The next youngest cousin's like 19 or 20. And so now the kids are old. Miranda does her thing. She's married. Mason, if he comes to me at the beach on vacation, it's pretty much like that. That's all that. That's, hey, dad, and I know what that means. Give me money and my cousins were going to Taco Bell. You know I mean? That's pretty, pretty much it. So Giovanna's with her parents and sisters. Mason's with his cousins and I walked the beach alone. And I felt like I was getting old. And here's why. The same people that have been coming to this place have been coming for 20 years as well. We know all the same people because it's the same week and the same location every year. And so I remember 20 years ago, some of these, these people would come in and they had babies, like, I mean, little teeny babies. And now these babies are grown and some of them are getting married. And I'm like, How, when did this happen? One, one actual, this girl, she was 22 years old. I remember her mom and dad bringing her when she was a baby. She looked at me and she goes, well, you're not a grandpa yet? <laughs> no. 
And I walked to the beach and I thought, man, I'm getting old. I feel old. It's just 20 years. I was almost 30 when we started going and I've been for 20 years in a row. Signs you're getting old. How many people feel like you're getting old? I've got some signs I want to start with just so we can track together for just a minute. Signs that we're getting old. Here's the biggest sign that I feel lately that I'm getting old. My back goes out more than I do. I hate it. The other day I just bent over and I'm like, <laughs> I never, my wife and I would go on a date, but we're getting old and we're cheap. The other night we went, we got home, we went on a date. We went to Chick-fil-A, we had a $10 gift card, we split a meal and a peach milkshake, and we went to a movie at Governor's Crossing. This is a sign you're getting old. I asked my wife, I said, honey, the movie starts at 610 or 720. Which one would you like to go to? 720? What time will we get home? <laughs> Which movie do you think we went to? The 610 movie with the elderly and the children, right? I mean, that. we got home. We spent $17 on a date. I come home, do something, my back goes out. It's crazy. I mean, Mike put a picture up. Look at this. I mean, that let girl don't look old to me. She looks constipated. She doesn't look old. <laughs> beach, son, I'm getting old. When you quit trying to hold your stomach in, no matter who's looking. You know, you take the shirt off, walk to the beach. I know I look, when my shirt's off and I'm running down the beach, I know I look like David Hasselhoff, but um, you know, I was walking around the beach the other day and Javonna, she actually stopped me. She goes, what are you doing? She goes, it really don't look any different, Brent. Thanks. You sign you're getting old, you're proud of your lawnmower? I'm just, if the shoe fits, you know, wear it. You enjoy hearing about other people's surgeries. <laughs> people call you at 9 p.m. and ask you this question, did I wake you up? <laughs> your ears are hairier than your head. Nobody look around. Everybody look straight ahead real quick. Don't look. You got cable just for the Weather Channel. That's the only reason you got cable. I remember that infamous picture, right? Um, here's the worst one, though, and, I, and this, is, this is interesting because I'm starting to really look around, especially when you um, at the beach and you've got family and you go into maybe their room and they're on the couch at 2 in the afternoon for their siesta. Here's the sure sign that you're getting old. You're asleep, but other people worried are worried that you're dead. <laughs> Who's ever poked that bear before? You're like, is he alive? You're like, Brent, you lost your mind. So I'm going to drop the hammer here. I want to get really serious, and you're going to be like, you're going to get really depressed. You're going to be like, what happened on you on vacation? Because this is depressing. Bring Matt, Keith, and Mike back quick. I'm going to ask you this question. It's a leading question for you to think about, just from my heart, for a few minutes. What would you do different if you knew for sure you had limited time? What if you knew that you only had a few months to live? talked to a man in the first service here today who basically said, Brent, I have been given 18 months to live. What would you do different? Just, just run through the Rolodex. I'm going old school with the Rolodex. Some of the young people are like, what's a Rolodex? Mentally run through your life for a few minutes. What would you do different if I told you that, hey, six months from now, Somebody's going to swerve over, you're going to be on 66, and they're going to hit you head on, and you're going to die. And I just, somehow God told me, I know. And you knew, you're like, okay, you believed me. You're like, I have six months to live. What would you do different? I have a feeling it would be a lot. It'd be different. There would be things that now become important and other things that you would discard, you would throw away. Do you realize that one out of one of us are going to die? Turn to your neighbor and say it, you're, you're going to die. Can you do that? You're going to be like, great, this is depressing. I really want to, listen, look at me. I want you to think about this this morning because some things happened that affected me and I just want you to get in my heart and mind and ask yourself how, how would you feel and it's interesting what can challenge us and what can actually inspire us when we look at it with the right perspective. The day before I left on vacation a few weeks ago, um, 
some, a man died in our community. He's very well known. He was a stalwart in our community. Sid Blaylock passed away. Sid Blaylock was in his late 70s, um, although he was getting up in age a little bit. He was a picture of health. Many years were ahead of him. He climbed a ladder at his home to help his wife out, and he fell off a 20-foot ladder, and just two days after that, he died. The day before I left on vacation, I spent... Uh, about an hour with Sid's grand, two of his grandsons just talking about um, just trying to help them cope with this, this tragic loss. I can relate. So that's how I started my vacation. Um, I started with a death in, in our community. Lots of people in our church were affected by that. A lot of people loved um, and, and knew Sid and his family. And so uh, I left with a heavy heart that day. It was a Wednesday um, that, that I left. Thursday... The first day of my vacation, I got a call from my son-in-law. My son-in-law, Houston, who I love to death. Houston's awesome. He um, treats my daughter well. He better. If not, he's in big trouble, and he'll, he'll, he'll be dead, and I'll be in prison. So um, <laughs> let's all do me a favor. Let's hold hands, and let's pray for Houston real quick that he gets it right. Um, he called me, and he said, Brent, um, you, 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 did you hear what happened to Wyatt? And I'm like, no, I know who he was talking about. And he, and he just talked. Talk, talked to me about his, this tragic death of a 19-year-old that my son was close to. My son just hit baseball with him on Monday. Now it's Thursday, and we found out Thursday evening that he, he, he lost his life tragically. He took his own life. I'm like, no, this can't be right. I mean, I, I would line up 100 kids, and I'm like, that man, that, that kid's got it going on. Such a sharp young man, 19, graduated from Sevier County, had a, um, was going to go to Johnson Bible College to play baseball. I mean, had everything, every, I mean, the world was uh, just right in front of him, talking about awesome. And I didn't know what to do. My son um, was very affected. He, he knew Wyatt. Um, he's a big part of the baseball family here in Sevier County. My son's looking at me, Dad, do I need to go home? What, what, do, we, what do we need to do here? And I looked at my son, and I had to make, a, I had to make a, the right choice, and I had to make the choice for him because he's like, Dad, I think you and I should go home and, and be with my baseball family, be with some of my best friends that are really struggling right now. And I said, no, Mason. I said, listen, um, we have very limited time with, your, with, my, with Giovanna's family, and your, gram, your grandmother is bad, and the sun sets and rises in, in, in your grandfather's eyes about you. You need to spend some time with your family. So we, we, we stayed. And I had to deal with phone call after phone call after phone call. So many people in our church affected by this 19-year-old. A couple days go by, and my son-in-law is now down on vacation. Um, my son-in-law, again, he is an awesome individual. He has a cousin. His cousin is named Hunter. He has a fiance named Mallory. I know them really well. Um, all of a sudden, Houston's great aunt calls. Her name is Jojo and said, um, Houston, did you hear about Mallory's dad? That Mallory's dad, um, they were the first day of vacation at Panama City Beach. Their whole family is there. Um, because of the hurricane or the tropical storm, it kicked up riptides. Two of Mallory's sisters got caught up in a riptide, and her 53-year-old father went out into the surf, as any dad would do, to rescue his daughters, which he actually rescued his two daughters, but he lost his life at 53 years old. He drowned the first day of vacation at Panama City Beach. So now my son-in-law is like, Dad, what do I, need, what do, I do? Do I, do I go home? I mean, although they lived in Maryville and it was a family member's fiance, but Houston and Miranda are planning to be in their marriage in just a few months. So now Mallory won't have her dad to walk her down the aisle because at 53 on the first day of their vacation, two daughters got swept away and he went in there like any one of us would do and just couldn't, couldn't hold on. So as I started to walk the beach and feel a little alone, man, death is like all around me. I'm like, what is going on? Typically in ministry, this is a weird stat, but it comes in threes. So I thought, well, maybe it's, it's over. When all of a sudden, Houston comes in with this look on his face, and I'm like, what's going on? His great aunt Jojo, who called him about Mallory's dad, um, missed his funeral in Maribel. This was several days later. 
He used to come in and goes, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what is going on. Um, they, she missed the funeral. This is like Houston's grandmother, his great aunt, but really like his grandmother. She missed the funeral. They went and knocked on the door several days or just a day after that, like wonder why she missed Is she sick and found out that she had had an aneurysm in her home by herself and had been dead probably four days before anybody could find her. So it's surreal, right? When you walk the beach as a pastor, I, I probably fielded 50 phone calls from different people crying their eyes out on the, I mean, just the world has come to, I can't believe, I don't understand why as I look around and watch people on vacation. That's surreal. You're walking the beach and I walk mile after mile and I, I had, I mean, I, I was on the phone more on vacation than I've been on the phone with people in probably three years. I mean, it's crazy. I, I talked to people. I talked to one guy who is struggling with this 19-year-old's death probably for an hour and 50 minutes nonstop. That just couldn't, I mean, he is distraught, couldn't deal with this. Why? His question. And there are no easy answers. And so you walk the beach and you see parents playing with children and building sandcastles and dolphins in the distance. And you're trying to like, hey, I'm, God, I'm trying to hear from you. And, and death is like all around me. That's four tragic deaths, three of them uh, not of natural causes. A fall from a ladder, a suicide, and a, and a 53-year-old drowning the first day of vacation. And then a, a lady with an aneurysm. Many of us are like, wow, aneurysms, that's like a big fear. You don't know when that's going to come. So for me, obviously this doesn't pass me by. Three years ago yesterday, my dad died. <coughs> Three years. He died of a fall, a tragedy, a trauma. I still can't get it out of my mind. The day after I got home from vacation, last week I spoke in South Knoxville. I got home last Friday. I went to speak in South Knoxville Sunday. It was amazing. But three years ago, I did the same thing. I got off vacation. I went to South Knoxville. Just before I spoke in South Knoxville three years ago, my dog, Marlon, some of you know the story, had a heart attack on my bedroom floor and died at 4.30 in the morning. I went to South Knoxville, I preached, I don't even remember what I said three years ago. I cried like a baby because my dog of 13 years passed away. And some of you are like, Brent, that's a dog. <laughs> but who would have thought that after I got home from preaching, my mom and dad would show up. They were here at this campus. I was there. They heard us crying on the phone. Mom and dad showed up as Mason and I are digging a grave. Dad falls as he tried to get out of the car, which mom told him to stay put, but he wanted to get out and come hug his grandson. He fell when I rounded the corner. I don't even want to, y'all know the story. I don't even want to go there anymore. Um, it was the worst day of my life, and I still deal with that trauma. But three years ago yesterday, at 2 p.m. in the afternoon on a Wednesday, my dad died. And five hours later, I stood on this platform and preached. That's hard to compute. So, I thought about this, and maybe I'm a preacher and I'm weird, but after all of this that happened, I started to think, you know, the question in life is not, how do I avoid death? That's not the question, because all of us are going to die. One out of one of us die. Go ahead, turn to your neighbor again and say, you're going to die. That's not the question. The question is this, if you think about the brevity of life, and you don't know what a day holds, is this, how do I avoid not having lived? That's the question. Guys, bring that on the screen, that question there. How do I avoid not having lived? My dad, I visited his cemetery, his grave yesterday at the cemetery. It's down Chapman Highway. It's Seymour Memory Gardens. It's between our Sevierville campus and our South Knoxville campus. It's right down in Seymour. And it's still surreal to me to go to his grave. I, I really can't pass um, that cemetery without stopping unless I just don't have any time at all. I feel like it's disrespectful for me not to go by there. So I go by there often when I go down Chapman Highway. And for me to walk up that little hillside and see Larry Norman Freeman. My middle name is Norman. My last name is Freeman. To think this is my dad who I love, who was my biggest champion, my biggest cheerleader. I mean, he taught me pretty much everything I know that he's been in that ground, his body, for three years. That's hard for me to wrap my mind around. I used to go early on and talk to him. I know he couldn't hear me. He's in heaven. 
That's what I believe. I'm like, you listen, I mean, the Bible says there's no sorrow in heaven. There's no way I could be like, my son talking to me. I mean, I'm sure dad's like, hey, I have no idea. But for me, it's good. Anymore, I don't talk to him. I just go and, you know, I just make affirming statements about how, hey, dad, you know what? I just sit there and think, thank God for my dad. God, thank you. I talk to God more than that. God, thank you for my dad's life. And I look at those dates, January 3rd, 1943, August 3rd, 2016. That's kind of, I mean, the third, the third and the sixth. I mean, I start thinking, wow, wonder, um, dad didn't choose that. You can't really control the, the, the length of your dash, right? I mean, we don't have a dash between the dates. Mom picked a classic, simple um, tombstone. But I think about this when I go up there, and I think about this little spot right here. This little spot represents all of my dad's life between those two dates, everything that he did as a person. And sometimes how we think, you know, life is like we get so busy and this or that and stuff that don't matter at all. And pretty soon, we don't even go to these places, but when you go there and you look, really the essence of who that person was and the time and history is, is that little dash between the dates, that little spot. And, and if you walk around this grave um, yard, like so many other cemeteries, people put like names on the cemetery, what that person represented, good husband, good father, good leader, pilot. My mom just put pastor. But you can't just put a word on somebody's grave and say, well, that's who that person was. He was way more than a pastor to me. He was my dad. So I started to think about lots of things over these last few weeks as I got a chance to just go away and spend time with family, most importantly with God. You know, how am I presently using my dash? I started to think about that question. I mean, Sid Blaylock... He just thought he was helping his wife by climbing a ladder. We don't understand why people would take their own life. I know that the devil can, man, he, if he gets a foothold in your life and he, he mentally can get in there to where, you know, people just get trapped and imprisoned in their minds. Today, more than ever, think of mental illness. So many people having so many problems. How about this message being planned and already spoken Wednesday and look at the tragedy in El Paso and now Dayton, I mean, within a matter of hours. You just don't understand where people are, and yet we get so busy, and we, we think, you know what, we're going to live forever. The Bible will say this to me, and I think about this verse a lot. I do love this verse of Scripture. Psalm 90, verse 12 says, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. It always does occur to me the older I get that life is happening right now, not someday. The, when I was younger, I would push everything into the future. I don't know about you, but it seems like I never started to live my life. When I was younger, I wanted to be older. I just vividly remember at 10, I wanted to drive. My parents wouldn't take me to Kmart. I remember this vividly. I'm not going to pick on dad. I'll love on dad today. I'll pick on mom. She's here. I said, mom, take me to Kmart. I want a Batman kite. I wanted a Batman kite. For, uh, it's, it's weird what you remember as a child. I vividly remember this conversation. Hey, Mom, I want a Batman kite. And she's like, no, Brent, it's like 8 o'clock at night on a school night. We're not going to Kmart to get a Batman kite. And I just said, well, I'm 16. I'll drive myself and get me a kite. That's what I told her. That's weird already if you're 16 and you're going to Kmart to buy a kite. <laughs> When I was in college, my wife will tell you, I was ready to graduate college. I'm like, man, I'm in ministry. I can't wait for some of my ministry dreams to come true. I'm ready to go. The older I get, man, I push the clock forward. If I don't watch it, the staff will laugh, and they're like, Brent, you better preach to yourself, because I sat us down the other day. As soon as I got home, it's still July. I'm rolling through the calendar all the way through December into 2020. I'm like, I'm so excited about 2020. They're looking at us like, well, what about next week? I mean, yeah. But, I mean, a preacher, 2020? A pre I can't wait for 2020. Vision, 2020. Hindsight, 2020. I can see clearly. I mean, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> but 
I start to think about this and I have to stop, and that's why I probably alluded to this next ministry season. I don't want to wish any time away. It's easy for us to push the clock forward. I saw this the other day and I literally laughed out loud, scrolling through Facebook. Some of your posts make me laugh out loud. And I'm thinking to myself, you are lame. Get a life. You know who you are. I scrolled through Facebook and I saw that Carnival Cruise Line thing and somebody literally put on their Facebook post, only 383 days left to our cruise. That's more than a year. Wait till at least 364 for you to tell us all that you're going on a cruise to Cancun. Literally, think about that. People, I know it. I know Disney freaks in our church that they orbit their life. Oh, six months, I'll be at Epcot. Who cares? <laughs> what about between now and six months? We laugh, but man, that's all of it. If we don't watch it, we're always, what's next? What's next? What's next? And you don't, you're not, look at me. This is, this is true. Truth is like surgery. It hurts and then it heals. You are not guaranteed tomorrow. I mean, these are lessons that I continually learn. Teach me, God, to number my days that I might gain a heart of wisdom. You know why I need that wisdom? Because there are lots of things in life I can't control. I can't control, what, we can't control where we were born, who our parents are, what time period or culture we face. We can't control those things. I talk to everybody. I still am such a fan of the 50s. To me, I'm fascinated. I wish I would have grown up in the 50s. Everybody I've ever talked to loved the 50s. Hey, I was a big, you know me, I'm the 80s guy. I tell my wife all the time, I want to go back in time. Just a couple weeks. Just to comb my hair again, number one. <laughs> number two, go to the mall. You know, I watched a little bit of, my son was watching Stranger Things, um, season three, and one of the episodes was Battle of Starcourt Mall. Who watched Strange? Anybody? I mean, that was me. Scotto's Pizza, Aladdin's Castle Arcade, go to the movies and see E.T. and Indiana Jones. They don't make those movies anymore. Well, they still make Indiana Jones movies, I guess. We don't get to control a lot of things in life. If you think about it, life is kind of out of control. But we do, thanks be to God, we do get to decide how we use our dash. God determines the length. We determine its breadth, the quality and fullness of it. I like this verse, James chapter 14, toward the end of the New Testament, it says this, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this city or that city, spend a year, carry on business, make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. The Apostle Paul, man, he did not use his dash perfectly, but he would say this toward the end of his life in 2 Timothy 4, 6, and 7, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. We're not going to use our dash perfectly, I promise you this, but unless we're intentional, we will never truly understand the victory that is found in Christ and what life really is all about when it comes to really living. So I got a shirt, I had Jeff make it. It says dash life, I think I saw it somewhere. Live your dash. For some reason, I think that's going to end up being a series or at least a, a t-shirt. Anybody would like to buy one of these shirts? Raise your hand high. Who would like to buy one? Come on. They're $300. So you can see me after. <laughs> Just want you to think about some lessons of the last few weeks. And many of you know you've been devastated as well with um, some of the news of some of the deaths in our community. And hey, you know what? It is important to us to once again think about how do we let our faith and our life collide? See, as a Christian or a non-Christian, we're both in the same boat here. Your faith and your death one day will have a collision. And once you're dead, it's over. The decisions have been made. But until that moment, if you're not dead, you're not done. So your faith and your life can have an incredible collision. 
And Christ, man, not only will give us confidence and security and peace and hope and all that for the future, as I stood at my dad's grave yesterday and we, we held hands as a family and prayed, listen, you know, my prayer is this, hey, I stand here today with all kinds of hope that I will see my dad again. Because when my dad's faith and his death collided on my brick wall, he woke up in the arms of his Lord and his Savior. I know that to be true. That's what I believe. And so I don't stand there hopeless. I stand there with all kinds of hope that, you know what, Dad? I know I can't talk to you now, but one day I will talk to you again. Where do you stand? How are you living your dash? You don't know what tomorrow holds. You're like, well, preacher, that's not fair. Yeah, it is fair. This is why we come to church. These are the moments that really matter in life to allow our faith and our life to collide. Just think about this truth that we can come and kind of dwell on. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 through 32 how do we live something out? Think about this for a minute. Just put this in context, in perspective. In your anger, the Bible says, don't sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. I preach on that a lot. If you give the devil a foothold, he's going to take it. He who has been stealing, listen to this verse. Some of you have heard this before. Let's put it in the right kind of mindset for us. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, do something useful with his own hands. As I grew up and listened to that verse, what does that verse tell me? Get a job. But that's not what that means. That he may have something to share with those in need. How many of us are stealing other people's hope because we are not out there presenting the good news to a lost and dying world? Amen. Our faith and life have collided while other people are still looking for an answer, and the answer is found in Christ. Do not let any, any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Jesus Christ forgave you. Let's put it in context. Ready? You're like, that verse of Scripture is awesome. Okay, how about this? What if you had three months to live? Does that verse of Scripture look any different? Oh, yeah. We think we're going to live forever, but we don't know what tomorrow holds. Ultimately, as I go away and I, and I think about some things and I pray and I seek God's face, it always comes back to this for me, year after year after year, why I do what I do. And I do what I do to bring good news, to bring the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the answer to this one and only life. If you want to have hope. So the gospel, I kind of broke it down. I wrote it in my journal as I was gone. G-O-S-P-E-L. And I started to listen to some people and put some things together. I'm like, wow, that's a good way to look at it. The gospel, God created us to be with him. But our sins, our sins have separated us from God. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. Paying the price for sin, Jesus Christ died on a cross and rose again for me and for you that we might have life. Everyone, everyone, I believe this, who trusts in the name of Jesus Christ can have eternal life. And life with Jesus Christ, this is what I love the most, starts now and it lasts forever. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want you to do me a favor. Just in your mind, just think about that thought for just a minute. It's not a great thought to think about, but you never know what a day holds. What if I had a finite amount of time? I'm going to ask you a question, and I need you to, to answer it in your heart. Um, where have you put your faith and trust? In whom have you put your faith and trust? We all are putting our faith in something. To put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ... That is the answer that you were looking for, the answer to the six-foot hole. 
to say, you know what, I, I don't know what today holds. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I can walk out of this room and I'm not going to be paralyzed in fear, but I'm going to walk out of here with confidence knowing that one day my faith and my death will collide. But because of how I lived my faith and it collided with my life, that Jesus Christ, he is my savior, he's my redeemer, and he is my friend, and he is my Lord. And I have confidence and hope that no matter what tomorrow holds, he's got me. I'm going to build my life on that. If you've never done that before, and listen, it's not about how avoiding death. I mean, we're going to die, but it's how avoid not really living. Don't go through this one and only life not really understanding that Jesus Christ loves you and gave his life for you. It's a free gift of salvation, a gift that we don't deserve. Sometimes in church we think, well, if we pray a prayer, we mumble some words, then we're saved. Listen, it's not the prayer that saves you. It's you putting your faith and you putting your trust in Jesus Christ. It's building your life on that. Now, you can say some words, you can repeat some thoughts, and I really do, do believe it. it gives focus to our faith and our trust. Some of you might need to say this right now in your heart and your mind. God, thank you so much for sending Jesus Christ to die in my place for my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. He was buried and he rose again to conquer the keys of death, hell, and the grave. I trust in him to forgive me of my sins. I receive this free gift of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ right now. Right now. Some of you, it's time to put your faith and trust in Christ and you're like, Brent, man, that's exactly what I need in my life. If you prayed that prayer and you mean it from your heart, and you're like, Brent, I want to build my life on Jesus Christ. I want to walk out of here different than I walked in the door. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to raise your hand high and let me know it. Brent, that's me. I put my faith and trust in Christ. Something that I've been, been avoiding, something that I don't know why I've not done, but today's the day. You don't know what tomorrow holds. Raise your hand high. Leave them up for just a second, please. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Now listen, you need to tell somebody. You can start by telling me, Brent at pathwayschurch.com. That's my email address. Before your head hits your pillow tonight, email me and say, Brent, I put my faith and trust in Christ. Just wanted you to know it. You never know what a day holds, and I'm so grateful that today held my salvation, a free gift that I don't deserve. Tell others, come to church, grow in your faith. Open up your word. Quit being so distracted from all the stuff that doesn't matter. So many of us are using our dash in such a mad way. We're mad dashing around trying to do this and that. Stuff that won't matter. The stuff that we deal with here, eternal stuff, our relationship with Jesus Christ, I truly believe this, will matter 10,000 years from now. Let somebody know. For the rest of us, it's time for us once again to galvanize. It's time for us once again to jump into a new ministry season and say, we're going to grow in our faith. We're going to live our dash. We're going to use our church dash to really make a difference. It's time for us to bring other people along with us. We can't steal other people's hope by us not reaching out into our world of influence, trying to make a difference. God, use us in any way. Allow us to live our dash for you. All that you've done, we decide to build our life on you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.